All right, now we're good. Thank you, Tech. Uh, 615 Paul Russell Road, we're next to the fairgrounds and right across from Jack McLean Park. Everyone kind of, you understand where that is? Okay, good. Uh, let's see, oh, the pinnacle of my clip art career is coming up here. There it is, look at that. You all know the Grateful Dead bears, I assume, right? Here's my Grateful for Dead little insects, little beetles doing their little dance, right? Uh, so here's what we're gonna talk about, the importance of dead plants. Um, we all think about live plants, but dead plants are really important. We're gonna go over these Florida-friendly landscaping principles uh, and how utilizing dead materials is helpful for wildlife. Uh, we'll go over some maintenance activities that you can do going into the fall that will benefit uh, wildlife. And we'll talk about some other little reminders of ways that you can enhance your landscape to be inviting to wildlife. Uh, and I do have some, if you wanna know more about the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, I have brochures up here that you can come at when we're done and feel free to take all you want. So again, we often talk about trees as being very, very important. And we always think about live plants typically, right? And for all these reasons, oxygen, pretty important for us, wildlife habitat, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. They, you know, plants filter air and water for us. They stabilize the soil, they reduce erosion. And then there's all those quality of life benefits that we get from having a beautiful landscape, right? So even your landscape, but also driving around beautiful Tallahassee, it's a nice place, right? If anyone's lived down in South Florida or some big city, and then they come here, you can tell that quality of life benefit, just the mental benefit of being around so many plants. It's good for us, right? So lots of good benefits about plants. But, uh, well, we'll get to the dead ones in a little bit. When we're talking about wildlife value and plants um, benefit to wildlife, Doug Ptolemy, I'm sure, who hasn't heard of Doug Ptolemy in here? Yeah, I didn't think so, right? This is a very Doug Ptolemy kind of crowd. Didn't he speak to y'all's group maybe a while, a couple of years ago? Um, so I like Doug Ptolemy work because he's with a he's with a university right he's a researcher right so it, with extension that's our whole thing we want to provide research based answers to people's questions and so we can rely on Doug Ptolemy because it's been all you know peer reviewed and so what he's really done his research has highlighted the importance of insects that live on the trees so not just the trees being helpful for wildlife but all the wildlife that goes to the trees and then the wildlife that goes to eat that wildlife right and he actually proved that if you had more native trees, especially in your landscape, birds were able to reproduce more successfully. Uh, and another cool thing that I really like about Ptolemy is how he says you all have an impact on this, right? So who's part of the whole, uh, what's the big park thing? I forget the name of the effort, right? Where a uh, million, everyone know what I'm talking about? It's like, if we all put our collective efforts together on our own lots, we would, you know, be way more than the national parks and public lands. Anyway, I heard someone saying it maybe back there. America's National Park or something like that. Look up Doug Ptolemy's website. He's got information, homegrown something or other, but look up Doug Ptolemy. He's got this program. You can sign up, put your, the acreage of your lot. Homegrown National Park, there it is. Thank you, Master Gardener Volunteers. Um, you can go in there, put your property acreage in there and like, you know, swear that you're going to do this and that. And they're trying to kind of like this idea of all of us can't really do something. It, you know, the news is kind of depressing a lot of the times about the plight of animals and wildlife, the environment, but we can try to do something and have it a positive effect. But that's all about live plants, right? Let's not forget about the dead ones. Uh, and so dead plants, especially trees, they can provide, again, long after they're dead, right? So I just walked around the trails and I was just taking pictures of dead stuff all over the place. Right? And I found myself doing this and was like, I should put these together and we'll talk about, you know, why dead plants are great for wildlife. So again, trees live for 100 years, say it's a live oak, it could go for two, 300 years. The thing falls down and for decades longer, it's supporting wildlife in various ways. I really like this photo that kind of breaks down or this graphic here. It breaks down all the little parts and pieces of a dead trunk of tree and all the space it provides for habitat, right? So you have large cavities, small cavities, horizontal cavities, vertical cavities, even the delaminating bark, right? So if you've seen those trees that are dying and the bark's kind of like half falling off, you knock some of that stuff over. There's all kinds of creepy crawlies in there, right? Um, 
you have sap runs, you have fungi starting to take over, you get epiphytes and ferns trying to grow on top of the dead plant. Um, so just all kinds of habitat in this one dead thing. And here's our wonderful um, you know, bird cavity. Uh, these cavity nesters, Audubon folks, you probably are familiar with this. These cavity nesters are really the ones that get hurt a lot, right? They're really in decline because we clean everything up, right? We, there's, we don't leave a lot of dead trees. And I've seen where there's even research where in rural and agricultural settings, going from wooden fence posts to metal T post fencing has actually reduced even more the ability of, of cavity nesting birds to kind of use those for uh, habitat. So it's really important, and especially with birds, you know, the cavity nesting birds are important. That's why it's something like a snag is great. Just don't leave a snag next to like the power line or the house or something like that, because that's not really safe. Um, it's more than just dead trees. Uh, and so it's little bits of the leftover flower heads of grasses, of other uh, shrubs, herbs, whatever it might be. And then it's also these little dead sticks and twigs that just pile up places in the yard, right? And so. I did grab a reference here from this um, National Research Council report in 2007 that basically did a whole review of the status of pollinators. It looked at honeybees, which are honeybees a native pollinator? No, they're not a native pollinator, right? So there's all sorts of information on honeybees and they looked into that, but then they had a whole other section on our native pollinators. And unfortunately, it's a little bit of a black hole what's going on with them because not a lot of people are studying them. You don't have millions of people, you know, keeping native pollinators like you do honeybees, right? So what they did is they showed that retaining dead branches or trees is an essential part of habitat management for healthy bee populations and communities, right? So I want to I want you to be lazy and try to keep yourself from picking up that little mess of twigs, okay? You, you and your spouse work this out. I know there's going to be some discussion back and forth, but you know, try to leave a little bit of that stuff around because it's really important. We'll have some examples later. How do wildlife utilize dead plants? So first it's food, right? And so when a plant dies, what's the first type of thing that starts coming in? Either an organism or the general, you know, the general group of organisms that start taking over. What are they? decomposers right so the decomposers start taking over and clara there loves fungi so it's a lot of fungi that start you know creeping into these dead plants and they're starting the natural breakdown bringing all of these nutrients getting it into a form that gets back into the soil so that you know the whole circle of life thing just keeps going and going uh fungi is one of them but a lot of little critters like crickets like little millipedes those little spring or earwigs, right? You're always kind of like creeped out about the earwigs moving around. Those are all decomposers as well, right? So they're breaking down bits of dead organic material. Uh, they're eating it, but what eats these things, Audubon? Birds, lots of birds, right? I mean, these are the, we'll talk about the food chain and the whole like trophic level type of deal, but you know, supporting these creepy little crawlies is helpful for all those cute things that you like to see out and about as well. So food is a big one, right? Dead plants can be food for you know, not just fungi, but lots of little insects that then you know, go up the food chain and help feed the you know, top predators. Uh, animals, wildlife will use it for habitat. So we have birds, obviously, right? So with cavity nesters like the bluebird, like the uh, pileated woodpecker, uh, but we also, and this is a little um, hummingbird nest here, right? Little hummingbird nest that's hanging out there, right? So they're using, not only dead plant material to make that little nest, uh, but also to like attach it to, right? So habitat uh, is important. Cover, so I apologize if you don't like spiders. This is mama spider with all of her babies on her back there. Um, they're using this for cover to hide, right? Leaves, veget you know, dead stuff laying in the, in the, the, the surface there. They're hiding from their predators so that little mama can keep her cute little babies all nice and strong and happy and healthy. Who likes spiders? Oh, good. Good job, Audubon. Um, nesting material. So from like the small stuff to the major stuff here. Uh, so you got like a little Carolina wren in the utility box there. Carolina wrens, right? You leave the garage open for like 10 minutes and they're already made a nest and have babies in the whole nine yards. Uh, but then it goes the other way to these big things like beavers. And who likes beavers? All right, everyone, like most people in here like beavers. 
Um, Jim Stevenson, you all know Jim Stevenson, local water quality guy. He was the only one that called the county actually looking for, he wanted a beaver in his pond, right? Most people call this like, how do we get rid of these things? And Jim's like, hey, how do I get one? It's like, man, we we just tell people the trappers. And then we're like, you should just call the trapper and see if they'll get you one. Uh, but anyway, nesting, so dead wood, this is extreme, right? Because beavers actually kill the tree to the dead material to help build their lodge or their dams. Uh, we have lots of beavers in town. You guys seen beaver dams in town and evidence of beavers in town? Yeah, so the uh, lows on the west side, all behind there on that uh, O'Clockney State Forest or Lake Talquin State Forest, I guess, lots of beavers over there. And even on Miccosukee Road near Blairstone, that little stream that heads towards Tom Brown Park, there's usually some beavers in there. And sometimes you see them, unfortunately, dead on um, Blairstone Road there. And perching materials, another good reason to leave some dead stuff around. And I always think, the, so the hummingbird there, I have this big live oak in the backyard. And there is a branch that comes way down that's been dead for a long time. And so many times, you know, I have to kind of duck under it when I'm going that way. And so many times I just wanted to cut that sucker down. But there's a big chunk of cannas. I know they're, they're, I'm getting rid of the Master Gardener volunteers. It's canna indica. It's the one that's in, on the invasive list now. But the hummingbirds absolutely love this canna indica. And can, the, the, the hummingbird is always at the canna, but they light on that little branch that comes down from the live oak. So I continue to duck under it and I leave it there because the hummingbirds, it's kind of special when you see a hummingbird stop and just you know, hang out for a little bit, right? Because they're always so darn busy and moving around quickly. Uh, and then I also have a hawk. So the, there's another huge live oak further back. Uh, and every time I mow the grass, the hawk stays there and watches me, right? Because it picks up little voles or whatever it's going after in the landscape, right? It's picking up something. And sometimes when I walk under his favorite little dead branch of the oak tree, there's big bones, which I realized later were rabbits. It was getting rabbits and eating their rabbits up in the oak tree and the bones were falling down on the ground underneath. Uh, so let's also not forget the really small things. So we had the millipede, we had the cricket. Um, we have to remember that the, all these critters that aren't very charismatic are important for all those things we do like to see, right? So the, the chart on the right, is showing just kind of this, you know, how much space or how many of these organisms are in a square meter. You know, the birds up there at the top, uh, you know, basically a square meter can, you know, support, you know, maybe one vertebrate such as a bird. But then it's like orders of magnitude as you go down, right? So when we get to the springtails, you know, there could be 50,000 in a square meter. We get to mites, which, you know, none of us really like the sound of having mites around, but they are important. We're talking about 100,000, right? Nematodes, Master Gardener volunteers, ne nematodes, they know this, you know, nematodes are often, uh, uh, you know, they got like a bad reputation because there's some parasitic ones on plants that damage our plants, but there's a ton of really good beneficial nematodes out there and there's a ton in the soil, right? All these things, as we get smaller and smaller, we get more and more of them, they're supporting that layer above it. And so if we like birds, we got to have all these other creepy crawlies and tiny little things as well. And on the left is showing the soil food web. Uh, I got a degree in soil science as well, so I love all the soil stuff. Lots of cool things happening there. Uh, but we need all those things, right? The soil's microbes are supporting the plants. The plants are supporting the insects. It's great. So let's talk about some animals that need dead wood, some part of their life cycle. Uh, we're going to go over some amphibians, arthropods, birds, and mammals. By the way, this uh, little graphic is from the Xerces Society. I got their link up later. Xerces Society. Who's familiar with the Xerces Society? They're a great uh, nonprofit that focuses on uh, uh, invertebrates, I believe. I think they do all kinds of insects. Uh, so amphibians, uh, frogs and toads, right? There we have some using dead material for cover, right? They're always hiding. Oak toads, you guys see those little oak toads always in the backyard, kind of hiding under the leaves of the oak trees. Um, turtles, so there's a little box turtle or something hanging out in the leaf. Uh, and your salamanders, who gets those broadhead salamanders in the, in the house, or in, not in the house, but in the yard? Um, they can be really big. You think a snake's moving around nearby you, but it's just a huge uh, broadhead skink. Uh, that's our, um, yeah, right, broadhead skink, is that right? Skink, not, yeah, sorry. You know, all you, you know, I'm a plant guy. You animal folks, help me out here. Um, but anyway, using these mostly a lot for cover, right? But a lot of their prey is going to be mixed in that dead plant material as well. Arthropods, look, 
Dead plants are so important for bees that they sell us dead plants in cute little bundles so that we buy them and put them in the yard, right? Those little bee nest houses, right? Uh, really, you could just leave dead stuff laying around and boom, you kind of, you got it there already. Uh, so bees, of course, really, really important to have some um, dead material around uh, because they're either going to hide stuff in there or they're going to, maybe not all just bees, but all sorts of things we're going to burrow in, beetles, they're going to burrow in those dead plant material and they're going to lay their eggs in there. Uh, and you can actually see that sometimes uh, when you look closely, right? So if, you, if you're messing around with things, you know, these dead sticks and stems, uh, look closely at them. You'll see little holes. Sometimes I like to crack the little hole and break the stick open and see where the little larvae is because there's usually some more life in that, that little dead stick. Here's some butterflies. So the red banded hair streak, it actually lays its eggs on fallen oak leaves. Uh, they need a place to put their little chrysalis and pupate, right? So oftentimes they'll find some nice little cozy, you know, dead branch somewhere where that's going to, you know, they'll be protected. And you even have some that will cluster up leaves, right? And kind of like uh, nest in those dead leaves. So leave your sticks and leave, you know, put the rake down. These are some of my favorites. My children get annoyed with me walking around because I'm like, twig girdler, twig girdler. Uh, but hickory trees, Helen Roth, I know you see twig girdlers out that way. If you ever go to Rea Garden of Eden and you see a hickory branch on the ground, look closely because oftentimes it's been perfectly cut, almost like someone took a saw and like very carefully sawed that branch off. It's a twig girdler. Right now, they're kind of like a beaver where they're creating dead wood. But so the twig girdler is going to move around the female, right? She's going to chew and chew and chew. As that little stick starts to fall down, she inserts her egg. The stick falls to the ground and the egg develops inside that fallen twig, right? And so that's the process for the twig girdler. That's what it does. And so it's really fun to see these perfectly sawn or these sawed uh, twigs on the ground. And then the leaf rolling weevil is another one of my favorites. I have a ton of this one on the live oak in my backyard where you all see every now and again, they just fall down. This little critter, it's a weevil. You see it's weevil little snout here a little bit. Uh, it makes a little cut in the leaf. It rolls the leaf up like it's you know rolling a cigar basically. It lays its egg in there and boom, it falls on the ground. And that's, that's gonna like develop over winter perhaps, right? And kind of develop in that little rolled up leaf and emerge as an adult and the cycle of life continues and continues. This one I like to show, this started as a, as a slide and something else and it's not totally necessarily just dead stuff, but uh, it does incorporate some dead stuff in here. So I threw this slide in here. So the Southern flannel moth, also known as the pus caterpillar or I think I've heard people call it the Donald Trump moth because if you look at it from the front, it's got one of these like weird kind of brush things going on with the hair. Uh, sorry to bring any of that up, but uh, pus caterpillar, has anyone been hit by a pus caterpillar before? Painful, really, really painful. Yeah, like about as worse, about as bad or worse than the saddleback caterpillar, right? I mean, it's bad, it hurts. So this pus caterpillar is, uh, it's one of the insects that lives on an oak tree, a live oak, right? So if you've read Doug Ptolemy and Charlie Bazin, he does these talks, right? Where here's the top trees you wanna plant if you want birds to come, right? And so live oaks are, oaks in general are the best because they attract all these you know, organisms. One of them is this flannel moth. Uh, the cool thing about this is that there's the cocoon of the flannel moth. So this little fly on the lower left, right? It actually invades it lays its eggs inside the cocoon and the larvae eat the flannel moth larvae, right? It's, it's eggs develop and they're basically eating, or not the larvae, but the pupating flannel moth in the cocoon there. There are beetles that also, that's what this little grub is, right? This is, and that's another kind of insect that will also take over that cocoon. Uh, but even the cocoon, once it's done, right? So this could be on a dead twig. We'll connect it back to dead plants because we got to get back there a little bit. Uh, you got a dead twig. You got this cocoon on there. Now an ant is using that for shelter, right? And it's got its eggs kind of protected there. I think that's an ant or it might be a wasp. I can't really tell at this point. And then you got the spider all the way on the end, also using this little piece of dead cocoon leftovers for a home, right? Uh, the cool thing too is that cocoon will then get by lichen right so all these things right and there's this is just like one little piece of it right this is such a tiny little example but that's what's out in your yard 
if you let things just kind of be a little bit. Birds, right? I already had the pileated woodpecker, but this picture, I couldn't resist putting it in there. It's a great picture. Um, so birds obviously use this for nesting material. Uh, cavity dwellers, again, we spoke about those already. It's really important to leave some of this dead snags, larger pieces of dead material around uh, for things like the nut hatches, the bluebirds, you know, these cavity nesters that really need our help. And who doesn't like seeing the pileated woodpecker fly through the yard? Except if you have fig trees, you know, they love figs. Uh, and I have to like shoo them out of the fig tree to get to my fig sometimes. And they're really big when you get close to them. That's a big old bird. It's no joke. Uh, and then mammals, right? So then mammals, some of them are pests for us, right? A lot of us, you know, with squirrels or flying squirrels. Most of us don't are cool with flying squirrels. We don't like squirrels. Possums, opossums, um, right? A lot of people don't like seeing opossums in the yard, but they're going to use those cavities, those large cavities to, to live. Uh, the raccoon I have in the live oak tree in the backyard, the big one way in the back, they are always up there hanging out. Like I've seen them like a hammock, just like laid back in the crotch of a branch. Uh, there's raccoons up there. They love to try to get the chickens in the yard, but I got that on, I got that taken care of. And even bears, right, are going to want to, who's ever been in the woods and seen where maybe a bear has just ripped out dead wood trying to get into the grubs and the beetles that are in there, right? So bears kind of secondarily also need dead wood because its food is in there, right? Just like we were talking about that the food web, right? The food chain, it's, it's all kind of connected. If we want these big charismatic things, we need a lot of the small stuff too. So let me tell you how about how these F Florida friendly landscaping principles, FFL principles kind of tie into supporting wildlife and you know why you should, dead plants kind of ties in nicely to this as well. These Florida-friendly landscaping principles, by the way, this is things that extension agents across the state of Florida teach to citizens, to the, to the state, the folks in the state. Basically, it's trying to get them to have a beautiful landscape while protecting natural resources, right? The main focus is water quality and quantity, but you can see how some of these are going after fertilizer use, uh, use of attracting wildlife, uh, managing yard pests using pesticides sparingly, uh, so this is this is the kind of stuff that extension agents and Florida is really uh, there's I can't think of another state that has something kind of like this where the whole state is working on getting this information out to the citizens. It's pretty great. So right plant right place is one and this is where you can use you can select plants for the landscape where they're going to have some dead material that can be showy and still be useful to wildlife. So a lot of the ornamental grasses fit that really well. Uh, what grass is this, by the way? Does anyone know what this grass is? This is the wood oats. This is the wood oats, casmanthium. And we have a bunch there in the front as the, in the bend by across from the live oak and bed two at the extension office. And it looks beautiful, right? I mean, it's, it's you know, it's brown. And this, you know, the other thing, we'll, we'll, I can come back and we'll talk about how brown is a color too for the landscape. Uh, because uh, in the winter time, you want to leave some of this stuff around. It looks interesting. It rustles in the wind when the wind blows, and it's going to provide for wildlife. Use of mulch. So mulch, dead plants, right? We use a lot of mulch in our lands in our gardens. This is bed five. A couple of years ago, you go there right now. It's like a totally different place. Uh, you can barely see from there back to where those purple mountain martin gourds are, because uh, the fire bush is about this tall, and you know butterflies are all over right now so come by and visit it's really nice but mulch dead material we use it to pr uh, slow down the weeds you know it doesn't really get rid of the weeds but you know ideally it slows them down a bit and as that stuff breaks down not only is it food for wildlife but it's feeding your plants too right it's adding organic matter to the soil also good for your landscape plants uh, number five you att attract wildlife again you can leave some snags provide them some water and boom you will have birds there right uh, they'll just show up. Managing yard pests responsibly. If we're doing all these things to try to encourage wildlife, we really got to think about how we're using pesticides. So you have a beautiful little side area, uh, maybe the backyard, uh, but maybe you like lawn, right? But if you're really trying to work on encouraging wildlife, even all these small little critters, you really want to think about, are those weeds in the lawn that big of a deal? Are the sod webworms in the lawn that big of a deal? Because if you put down insecticides, unfortunately, a lot of those products are not discriminating for just the things that are eating your grass. You know, they're wiping out a broad range of species that are down there in the soil. And a lot of overwintering things that are going to be, you know, just hanging out 
Uh, so think fireflies, think blueberry bees, you know, most of their life is spent just sitting in the ground waiting for to emerge as an adult. If you're spraying stuff, uh, that's going to affect them, right? So you want to really be thinking of, you know, how much damage can you handle and what kind of products can you use to be a little more specific uh, and targeted. Recycling yard waste, uh, that is one where, again, leaving brush piles. So those little sticks that you want to pick up, instead of putting them by the road to haul them off, you know, make little brush piles as much as you can. And you will get things show up. So we got a squirrel hopping in the one, and we got a raccoon climbing on the other one. Uh, but there's brush piles kind of scattered through my yard, and there's always something creepy crawling in there when you go by there, right? Maybe the skinks. Uh, the hawk will every now and again fly over and land on one. You know, it's getting something. Now, will these encourage snakes? Perhaps. Uh, but, you know, snakes got to live somewhere. May, if you don't like snakes, don't put a brush pile like, you know, right by where you walk all the time, right? Like maybe way in the back, it'll be okay. So a couple of things that we can do, maintenance practices to enhance wildlife utilization of your landscape. We can minimize and time our pruning better. So um, minimizing pruning, right? If you have that branch that I have in the backyard, that dead branch that hangs down low, you kind of want to go clean it up. Try to hold back a little bit and leave some of that stuff there, right? Just keep walking under it. Remind yourself that that's a hummingbird is going to land there or a hawk's going to land there, and you're going to be able to watch it. Uh, so let trees be a little bit wild. Let them be a little ugly. Uh, we have an old cedar trees in our demonstration garden, and an arborist told me, look, Mark, you could cut them down because they're kind of old and raggedy, or you leave them like we do our senior citizens, and you, you, know, you kind of admire them as they get old, right? So don't just cut them down when they don't look good for you, right? Like, leave them there and respect them. And it's like, okay, I like that. And you got this little saying, right? You know, twisted tree lives out its life. A straight tree ends up as a board, right? So when you go into the woods and you see those really big cypress trees that they left for some reason, usually it's because they were, you know, they were blown off up top and they left them, fortunately, so that we can see a little bit of what might have been there. Uh, leave some dead branches around there. Be a little lazy. Leave it a little wild. Uh, pruning back in the winter time, especially, you know, as you, you all that your landscape stuff, you know, kind of goes brown. It uh, freezes back. Leave that stuff there as long as possible, and ideally. Uh, into the spring beyond the chance of frost. Uh, not only is it gonna be helpful for wildlife utilization, but it will actually protect your plants as well. Um, the, that dead stuff that sits above, you know, that crown where more plants are gonna come out actually is like insulation and it's actually gonna give your uh, plants a little cold protection as well. And then when you do cut that stuff, uh, you know, make it a little brush pile maybe. Here's some information, this was a really good, um, little handout that uh, I forget who exactly did. This might have been something with Xerxes, I forget, or I can't remember exactly where I picked this one up from, but this is talks about these these nests, like deadheading, right? A lot of people want to deadhead uh, their, their flowers, right? So the flower finishes, you go and you cut the dead one out so that you get more blooms. You don't have to stop deadheading all of them, but leave, leave some of them there, right? Because again, these insects are going to, just like those cute little bee boxes they sell you, right? The bees are gonna turn this into a, just a bee box that's already there in your, house, in your landscape. They're gonna lay their eggs in there, they're gonna develop in the larvae, and then they will hatch out the following spring. So try to leave as many as you can. If you do cut them, maybe just leave them right there in place, right? Then don't put them in a bag and throw it away and send it to the street or something. Allow for a little debris. Here's the extension office again. Lots of leaves all over the place. Um, you know, if you can, let the debris lay as long as you can. If you want to get rid of it, maybe quickly just rake it into the garden bed that it fell from the tree from it that it fell from, right? Or if you have a live oak or some big oak tree, typically there's lots of shade. Your grass doesn't grow as well. All those trees fall in the fall and the winter just kind of rake it over to the base of the tree and make it just a natural little mulched area and boom, you don't have to do all the work and you're gonna be supporting all kinds of wildlife that's gonna use that uh, leaf for cover, those, those leaves for cover. Create few or many, right? Go crazy if you want to, go small, go big. Uh, I tell folks that even if you have just a little, you know, just a little like a little shrubs, right? You can kind of hide stuff back in there. You got, you know, a lot of folks got the boxwoods up along the house. 
right? Just make a little pile up by the boxwoods behind them. It doesn't have to be big, but any little bit of sticks left around will help. Uh, leave snags, right? Those are the dead tree stumps, right? When safe. Um, Wendy Wilbur, uh, who's the state master gardener coordinator, she left a snag, but she left it too close to the power line and the stinking snag came down and she couldn't make some meeting because she had to go take care of her power bill or power line. Uh, and again, just resist removing every bit, right? Try to leave some of that stuff behind. And of course, if we're trying to, again, you know, support all this wildlife, be careful about your pesticides, do monitoring, make sure you properly ID what you think is a pest. What do we have here, y'all? Any idea what that you think is good or bad? Top right. We got master garden around here. It's not fair here. They've seen this picture before. That's a ladybug larvae, right? So ladybugs, good or bad, y'all? They're good, right? They're really good. They eat a lot of aphids. Actually, the larval stage eats more aphids than the adult stage, right? So you want to see more of these in the adults. But some people might see this and be like, oh my gosh, I got to spray something. It's going to get it. And, you know, no, right? Make sure you properly identify what's going on. Accept some damage. How many of y'all have milkweeds? And then you get the aphids all over the milkweeds. And you're like, uh-oh, what should I do? If you spray it with a lot of these products, you're going to be harming the caterpillars that ideally you're attracting to the milkweed plant, right? So just... Just leave them be, accept a little bit of damage. Uh, you know, when the damage gets so bad that the plant is like terrible and it's like an eyesore in your landscape, then maybe, you know, call us up and we'll help you figure out a good way to do it. But allow for a little bit of damage from pests. If you can choose selective products, right? So things like BT or Thuricide are very specific to caterpillar pests. Uh, so those won't harm a wide array. They won't hurt the beetles and, you know, some of these other larvae that are in the soil. Uh, BTI, which is another kind of bacillus. Uh, who uses the mosquito dunks? Anyone use those mosquito baits, right? The little dunks or the bits. Uh, those again are really great because they're very specific to mosquitoes and they don't hurt, uh, you know, there's very few other organisms that it harms. Again, try not to spray stuff on non-target plants or animals. And if you are gonna use a pesticide, always, 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 always read the label. Read it two or three times and don't, fiddle with the thing on the back and rip it and you know smear it with mud go online and look up the product and the label so that you can read it on your computer and you can search for things and you know read it much easier and let's remember you know all of these organisms right we're trying to support the whole food chain so that we get the that the, that charismatic wildlife at the top so all of our practices we want to help all of the critters some other things to consider uh, for wildlife in general is reducing night lighting, right? So you've all heard of the plight of like fireflies. So let's, you know, as much as we can keep the keep keep it dark. Here you can see, you know, um, the Florida sky at night or Florida from night from space, lots of lights. So a good way to around that is like motion detectors, right? So I got neighbors that is like glaring light all the time. All right, all you need is like motion detector. So if the the perpetrator comes around or some you know evil thing comes around it'll pop on and they'll scare them and dash away uh increase vertical layering um you know leave your dead stuff on the ground and then when you're picking new plants to put in your landscape you know try to get all those little layers hit right tall stuff medium low shrubs herbs ground covers the more complexity you put into your landscape right the more niche habitat you create and the more organisms are gonna show up. And I always think of, you know, the hawks like it really up high, the bluebirds are somewhere in the middle and you got brown thrashers and things on the ground and your wrens are down low, right? So if you create more of these layers in your landscape, you'll see more wildlife. This is my PSA against leaf blowers. Uh, consider your equipment. This is because I have a neighbor that like on a Saturday morning at like nine in the morning, you know, wants to like use the leaf blower in the fall. It's like, really? Come on. Uh, so leaf blowers, not just, it's, you know, you gotta be careful with your ears. So when you're using that equipment, use some, you know, use some ear equipment or ear protection. Um, and it's also exercise, right? The rake, right? Good old rake. My neighbor one time said, Mark, you know, they make a machine for that. And I was like, oh, I love it, Tommy. This is my, it's like rock. It's like, you know, the meditative rocks, right? And making in the sand, right? Making designs. Just think of that's what you're doing when you're raking. It's a good exercise. You need it. 
Uh, and then consider aesthetic values and their input, right? Do we have to make everything look so formal, right? The hard thing about leaving dead stuff around is that it's not like what we're used to thinking is the right way to keep our landscape and make, you know, keep up with the Joneses type of thing. Uh, but, you know, really consider, do we need to be such a formal kind of look all the time? Can we be a little bit wild and crazy maybe? Uh, if you want to um, compromise, you may, you know, make your landscape like a mullet, right? Where it's business in the front yard, but it's all wild and crazy in the back, right? Let the, you know, where the neighbors don't see it, let it be all crazy back there. Uh, my wife gets on me like, Mark, what, what is that? Like, why aren't you mowing that? And why aren't you mowing that? It's like, that's our, this is our wildlife preserve, darling. Like, you know, those little rabbits you like to watch and the birds that they're going over there. Um, remember that we're not making any money off of our ornamental plants. So when it comes to spraying and like pushing the yield or the, you know, the look of your plants with fertilizers and pesticides, remember that it's just for us. You're not a farmer who's depending on the, the product of your work to pay the bills. So let them wilt a little bit, let them get a little bit of insect damage. It'll be okay. Uh, and then remember, like Doug Tommy says, right? Even our really small patches can be really beneficial. And if more and more of us start changing the way we do our landscaping and these patches, you know, can grow bigger or we can connect more of these patches, you know, wildlife can then utilize them. Uh, and that's what these images are trying to show here, right? The wildlife ecologists know that, you know, you got a big ecosystem, you, you know, you start cutting it up and it becomes like little islands. It's much harder for wildlife to move and uh, freely from, you know, patch to patch. So ideally we have patches and we have some corridors that can help connect them. So think of your yard perhaps as the corridor that's connecting a large state owned property or natural area to other ones, right? So they can use a little, little like Frogger, right? They can get across easier. Okay, some resources to help you out. Uh, you got all the IFAS ones here. So Florida Friendly Landscaping website's really handy. Uh, the EDIS website, I think it's now called Ask IFAS. They keep changing the name of this thing. But those are all these um, publications that specialists on campus put together. And you will find, like, there's a one really good one on, like, the top 10 things for uh, wildlife habitat in your backyard. And it'll, you know, some wildlife professor put it together, and it just steps you through the things that you can uh, do for wildlife in your landscape. The IFAS bookstore also has some more um, helpful resources regarding landscaping, wildlife. Uh, there's books on, I know, plant ID. I don't know if they have anything on birds, Audubon, but you should check out the IFAS bookstore. They might have some good stuff there. Some other resources, the Xerces Society I mentioned early, they're really great. They come up with a lot of good kind of how-to manuals and documents. Uh, they come up with cutesy little social media type stuff too to get out there to try to um, persuade people. The Pollinator Partnership, uh, this is another one. This is kind of funny because this is a group of um, basically like pesticide companies. And this is their like do good campaign, right? Of trying to tell people about the, you know, pollinators and, you know, trying to protect them. But they come out with some really beautiful posters and other, you know, kind of handouts that you can look at. If you're interested in um, pesticide safety and things that you are using, your lawn service is using, the National Pesticide Information Center is at Oregon State, and it's really great. You can, there you got these little kind of fact sheets on all these various pesticides, tell you what it does in the environment, what does it do to humans, how does it affect wildlife, really a great website. And then Healthy Yards is another one where they're trying to encourage folks to kind of, again, think of wildlife, uh, be thinking of your yard as a little haven for wildlife. And I can share this with the group if you guys wanna share the presentation. Uh, okay, now it's up to you all and Zoomland folks, right, to pass this information on, right? Because some people couldn't make it. The, some of the folks that need to be hearing this kind of stuff aren't here. So, you know, next time you're at a party and it's a very formal landscape, be like, mm, where's your brush pile? Or, uh, hmm, I don't see any dead stuff over there. What are, where are your insects, right? I don't notice any birds, right? So pass it on and try to encourage other folks to leave a little bit of dead stuff too. I'm working on the neighbors. They just think I'm nuts and lazy, but you know, I got to remind them that this is what I want. This is how I like it to look, okay? Um, so this is what we went over, uh, importance of dead plants, principles, maintenance activities, some other little enhancement reminders. And this I saw recently on Facebook, I couldn't find who put this up, who made this, but 
um, you know, this is like, again, you and some of your neighbors, perhaps, right? The Joneses where you're like, they're like, hmm, your yard's really messy. And like, yeah, I know. I like it that way. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, okay. Look, oh, and dead, dead plants for art. Look at that. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, that was at uh, SCAD. Is that what it's called in Savannah? SCAD? Uh, my wife and I visited there, and this artist, Carla Fernandez, had a whole display of really cool ways of using plants in art. It was great. Okay, questions? Yes, ma'am. Ah, thank you. Thank you for being a great audience. Appreciate it. Yeah, question? Hmm. So we're so you know we got really really cold in the winter time and I feel like there's a little delay in things right so like now at our office oh sorry the the question is a uh, really large fire bush hasn't seen that many zebra long wings around uh again I feel like this year there was it was a little bit delayed than other years because we had a <clears throat> really good cold winter that knocked a lot of those plants back and it probably slowed down some of the, you know, the cues for the insects to be emerging as well. But like at our office, and we get calls like this a lot, like, have you noticed there's not as many monarchs this year? And, you know, a lot of it's anecdotal, like we wouldn't know unless someone was doing a lot of kind of research and really surveying it. But uh, I, we have a ton of zebra long wings at the firebush at our place now. So, um, you know, just keep growing the firebush, they'll come back, I'm sure. Uh, anything else? Any questions, comments, concerns? Okay, Zoom land, you got any out there? Oh, we got a question here. Ah. Uh, yeah, so those could be, that could have been something remain. I don't know if it was part of the tree that fell and like sometimes you'll see them fall over and then branches kind of just start, they've sprouted right out of it, huh? Yeah. Yeah, so it can be, I mean, it's good organic matter, right? Feeding the soil and it could be a good little uh, bed for seeds to sprout in too. Yeah. Oh, what's the advantage of burning a brush pile or just leaving it there for wildlife? So in my yard, what I do, you know, a lot of the brush is going to be stuff that died back in the, from the winter, uh, or it's going to be invasive plants that I'm yanking out or, you know, other things that I'm just cleaning out. And usually it depends on the proximity to the fire pit, quite honestly, like the stuff that's close goes in a pile. And eventually when it's dead, I'll burn it. Uh, the rest of the stuff just, you know, when I'm over on that part of the yard, I just make a pile over there and it usually just stays. The thing with brush piles, they rot away, right? So you can make small ones and over time it, it just disintegrates. So I've had one maybe for two to three years that maybe started out about this tall and, you know, it was a smaller one, maybe that wide. And right now I can go up to it and just kind of mash on it. And it's just like, you know, rotten wood that's just falling apart. So if, you know, burning it is, um, Burning is not ideal, right? Because if you leave it in place, you're going to get more wildlife value. And when you burn it, you're releasing that, the carbon kind of back into the air, where if you leave it there, it's getting, you know, a little bit stored up and maybe, you know, captured in something else. And then you got to be careful with burning because people don't like to smoke either. <clears throat> right. Yeah, that's a good thing, too. I mean, um, some of these invasive woody plants, they're not really liable to start from cuttings. Like if you leave it on a pile, uh, if they have fruit on them, sometimes the fire will, you know, kind of sterilize that seed. But uh, we had a master gardener that, you know, would burn coral ardesia and it just sprouted right out of the burn pile too. So that doesn't always work. Those fruits are best, you know, something like that. The fruits are best to put in a bag and throw it in the garbage. Uh, where the the leafy, the vegetative material, the stems could be piled up and burned or just left in a brush pile. Was there any other questions, comments? Carol? 
Carol wants to know if it's impossible to get slides, and I will send them to Ben or. Okay, and then yeah, I can. Carol asked me, and I can send it right to you. And if Audubon wants the slides, they click on the links. I can send those to someone at Audubon as well. Okay, and I'll send it to Charlie maybe, and he can take care of the rest. How's that sound? <laughs> okay, folks. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Hi, Zoom land. Thanks. I thought of David Marshall's article about, about grass it? recently. Did you see it in the Democrat? Wait, you know? he talked about that?